Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Cornwell, and I'm Plunkett Cooney's Director of Marketing and Business Development. Today's program is part of the firm's Sophisticated Employer Webinar Series, which is sponsored by our Labor and Employment Law Practice Group. When we were kids, our parents always told us that nobody's perfect, right? Well, that's certainly true in the workplace. We all make mistakes, but rebounding from them in a positive way is the focus of today's presentation. We're fortunate to have with us the co-leaders of Plunkett Cooney's Labor and Employment Law Practice Group, Christina Coral and, Chris and Courtney Nichols. They'll walk us through exactly how we can repair and recover from some common HR miscues. But before we get started, I'd like to cover just a few things with you about our law firm and today's speakers. For those who don't know, Plunkett Cooney is based in Southeast Michigan and is one of the Midwest's oldest and largest law firms with approximately 150 attorneys. We have office, eight offices in Michigan and, and offices in Chicago, Illinois, Indianapolis, Indiana, and Columbus, Ohio. Our employment law practice group includes more than 20 attorneys who work in the areas of traditional labor law, human resources consulting, and employment litigation. Our sophisticated employer webinar series is designed to help human resource professionals, risk managers, and business executives stay up to date on important legal issues to provide HR best practices and to discuss trends in workforce management. Today's webinar is approved for 1.25 general recertification credit hours through the HR Certification Institute and for 1.25 professional development credit, uh, credits through SURE. Following your program, a certificate of completion will be emailed to each of you reflecting this credit. If you don't need it, simply disregard the certificate. As I mentioned, I'm joined today by Christina Coral and Courtney Nichols. Christina is a member of Plunkett Cooney's Board of Directors and serves as managing partner of our Columbus, Ohio office. She represents commercial clients, governmental entities, and nonprofit organizations, primarily in the area of employment liability. Christina also serves as special counsel to the Ohio Attorney General's Office, handling employment matters for the Ohio State University and the University of Cincinnati. For nearly a decade, Courtney's uh, exclusively defended employers in litigation and provides advice on all aspects of employment law. And that includes pre-litigation compliance with the ADA, FMLA, and Fair Labor Standards Act. Courtney also assists her clients with drafting and enforcing contracts, including covenants not to compete and, ex and executive severance agreements. Now for a few housekeeping notes about today's program. For the Q&A portion of our webinar, we're going to use our questions uh, window, which is located on your GoToWebinar navigation display. So if you could please take a moment now to locate it, um, you can enter questions as they occur to you throughout the program. At the end of the presentation, we're going to try to an answer as many of those questions as possible. But I always add one caveat. So please ask questions of a general nature. Discussing specifics or ongoing issues in your workplace is best done privately, as we are sure you would agree. Finally, I want to mention that today's session is being recorded, and that re that recording will be available on the event page of Plunkett Cooney's website, which is located at plunkettcooney.com. Thanks again for attending today's webinar. Courtney, I believe you're up first, so go ahead and take it away. Perfect. Thank you, John, and thank you, everyone, for taking the time out of your extremely busy schedules to meet with us today and talk about the worst case scenario in many cases, what happens when something goes wrong or you suspect that something might have gone wrong, how do you fix it, how do you limit the damage, how do you move forward, how do you frame the issue with your superiors. That's what we're here to talk with you about today. So breaking down a roadmap of our presentation, we've identified five scenarios that might be mistakes, they might be unexpected, but things that can occur in your everyday life that you need to jump in with both feet and figure out how to address. So I'll be talking with you about the first three scenarios and Christina will be breaking down the last two. So just to sort of run through these, a, a misclassification mistake that you suspect when you join the company, uh, an overpayment that has been issued to one, maybe several employees for several weeks. How do you recoup that? Can you recoup it? What are your options? What happens when a federal investigator knocks on your door and wants a bunch of your company documents and to talk to your people with very little, if any, notice? The classic phrase, but wait, I reported that to my manager weeks ago. You find out when it's too late or is it too late? And then the last one to know, 
Human resources should be the first one to know, but too often you're the last. So what do you do when you find out about a serial policy violating manager seemingly after several other people within the company? So launching right into this discussion, the misclassification mistake. So in our practice, we often see misclassification mistakes arise not because somebody was initially misclassified wrong and nobody bothered to fix it, but because somebody's job changed or the rules changed and nobody caught it during that slow transition period. And that's a scenario that can easily happen. So here we have Mary. Mary is classified as an exempt employee. She's been salaried exempt since 2005 when she was performing the duties of controller. In that role, she had several employees who were reporting to her. In 2011, the company hired a new CFO who rearranged Mary's duties and hired a new accounts payable manager. Since then, Mary has had no direct reports, and Mary has been consistently classified as exempt and never paid overtime, despite the fact that she's regularly working upwards of 50 hours per week during the busy season and especially prior to tax day. So what happens next? You come on the board, on the board or find out about this issue, and you got to articulate your game plan. So the first step in any game plan is identifying your weaknesses. So is the classification correct? Or was there a mistake made such that we have a weakness we need to address? So what are the, the most likely classifications for Mary? The executive exemption or the administrative exemption? So let's look at the executive administration first, right? The executive exemption. So if we get into the executive exemption, the requirements First, the individual is paid on a salary basis, at least $455 per week, which is about to change for those of you that don't know. Something to keep an eye on in a future webinar that will be sponsored by Plunkett Cooney once it's finalized. But for now, the law is that she's paid $455 per week on a salary basis. Mary's primary duty has to be managing the enterprise or a customarily recognized department or subdivision of the enterprise. She must customarily and regularly direct the work of at least two or more other full-time employees or their equivalent. So that could be four part-time employees, two part-time employees, and one full-time employee, so on and so forth. Here, we know that doesn't apply because Mary is no longer supervising anybody. So that's something to keep an eye on. Obviously, our scenario is dealing with Mary, but it's an issue that can come up in your business in other ways. If you have particular managers that might be close to the line of employees, of two or more full-time employees or their equivalent, and something changes such that now they only have one full-time employee and one part-time employee or three part-time employees, they are no longer going to satisfy the third bullet point on our slide as it relates to their supervision of the minimum number of employees. So this is a perfect area where somebody could be exempt, 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 and then slide into non-exempt quite quickly without human resources necessarily being alerted to that or upper management. So that's something you want to keep your eye on. In our scenario, that's, that's what happened here. We have Mary who's managing, managing, managing until she's not and nobody catches it. Is that the end of the analysis? No, because then we go to the next slide, and there is a potential alternative, which is the administrative exemption. So this is the next one that would jump off the page if you were trying to figure out whether there is a way for us to continue Mary's classification as exempt and feel confident that we're not making a mistake under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Administrative employees have to be paid a guaranteed salary, which is what we already discussed, they have to perform office or non-manual work directly related to the management policies or general business operation of the employer or the employer's customers. And in addition to those requirements, which is found on the next slide, they have to, and this is a kicker, customarily and regularly exercise independent judgment and discretion. Okay. What does that mean? That means that they're acting free of direction or supervision in matters of consequence and significance. So if Mary can resolve AP, account payable disputes, up to a limit of $500 or $1,000, and you are frequently having AP disputes involving hundreds of thousands of dollars, then Mary is not, she's not exercising significant amounts of authority 
free of direction or supervision. Mary is handling small, minute matters independently, which is fine, but that's likely not going to be enough to save your day and to establish that she meets this criteria required to prove that she is an exempt employee. And this is the key here, is that all employees are presumed to be non-exempt. So the Fair Labor Standards Act, like our other employment statutes on the books, are meant to be interpreted broadly and to provide as much protection as possible to employees. So if we have a scenario that's a close call, more often than not, the safe advice is to favor the employee's argument. So in this case, if Mary was going to assert a claim, she would say, yeah, I was able to write off $500 to $1,000 in AP debt, but let's look at the big picture here. This is a massive corporation. There are bills outstanding for hundreds of thousands of dollars. I had no discretion as it relates to those bills. I had no discretion as it relates to policies, to procedures. Anytime I wanted to do anything in the department, I had to approach the CFO. I had to put my suggestions in a memo that the CFO would then consider and talk about with executive leadership and get back to me. If that's the type of scenario that's occurring, if Mary's making suggestions and she's, she's off offering input, but she's not actually making the decisions free of control or supervision, then she's not going to meet this tricky independent judgment and discretion criteria. So there is a fact sheet that the Department of Labor publishes with regard to the administrative exemption that you can quickly find. This is the, in my opinion, most important fact sheet out there because this concept of independent judgment and discretion is the trickiest. And many people think that the administrative exemption is, is quite simply, are they performing office, non-manual, business type of tasks, like, like you would imagine somebody in the finance department or the IT department? And are they being paid a salary? And if so, we're in the clear. It's not that simple. And I, I too frequently see my clients miss the independent judgment and discretion component of the analysis when trying to classify people appropriately. So this is a key one to look at. In our scenario, based on what we know about Mary, if you presented this to me, I would tell you she's more likely than not going to be found to be a non-exempt employee, meaning she was entitled to overtime during that, that period, going back two years at least, three years if it's found to be a willful violation when, you know, from the date of our knowledge and from the date of her potentially bringing a claim if it gets to that. So then what do we do, right? What's, what's the next scenario? Like, like I said, if we err on the side of non-exempt. Okay, so now we have it. We've been presented this analysis by an attorney who is telling us we think that it's more likely than not that a, a judge and or a jury are going to find that Mary is non-exempt. Then what do we do? Do we just reclassify her? So sitting here today, do we just change it and say, you know what, Mary, we, we made a mistake. We're going to reclassify you. A lot of times my clients tell me, Courtney, that's going to raise a huge red flag. And, and we think if we make a jarring change like that to Mary, she's going to catch on that we screwed something up. And then she's going to go to an attorney and then they're going to file a claim and we're going to be in a much worse scenario than we are right now. So what do we do? Okay. If there's a concern about that, what some clients like to do is a, a slow transition where just like she slowly transitioned from being exempt to non-exempt, now we're trying to slowly transition her into a situation that is clear and that is more defined than her sort of amorphous position previously. Okay. So if we do that, what about transferring her to a salaried non-exempt role where we say, you're still going to continue with your salary. We're going to pay you overtime. And the reason why we want to figure out how much you're working is because we have a couple of efficiency focuses. We want to make sure we're doing things right. We want to track your activities and we want to make sure that we're maximizing your time here in the office. So not an admission of liability or an admission that you screwed something up, but rather a listen, we want to keep your salary where it is. We might offer you some overtime, but we just want to track things and make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And everybody in the department is profitable and efficient. That can happen. I've also seen my clients go to employees and say, listen, there's been changes with the Department of Labor. They've, they've made a few adjustments to the way that employers are supposed to look at things. So we have done the same and we are going to change a couple of positions. Yours is one of the ones that has been changed and this is what we expect moving forward. Again, more of a, this is a company change based on outside forces compared to a, this is a change just to you because we screwed something up. 
as I mentioned earlier, we're probably going to get a new Department of Labor uh, rule here shortly. There was a proposed rule issue as it relates to changing the threshold, the salary basis threshold, moving it up, obviously not to the level that it was under the Obama administration, but to a range in the low 30,000s, which is where we expect that to end up. 30, I think the, the, the number that was floated was right around $38,000. So if there is a change at that time, and now we get a salary threshold that is closer to the mid-30s, maybe encroaching closer to 40000 at that time, that's going to be a pretty big piece of news, and it might give us a great opportunity to review some of our classifications and make a number of changes. Again, not trying to raise red flags. There is an alternative option as it relates to a misclassification mistake, which is on the next slide. Just admitting it, okay? Just coming out and saying, we screwed up, we're going to take accountability, we're going to address this with you. Um, this is something that should have changed a couple of years ago, and unfortunately it did not. We have gone back and we've tracked what we believe to be the time that you worked. We've assessed that in 2015, you worked 200 hours of overtime. In 2016, you worked 300 hours of overtime. In 2017, you worked 100 hours of overtime. You can do it whatever way you want to do it. You know, you can assess it looking back over three years. So 16, 17, and 18, whatever the case might be and whatever the mistake might be and say, this is our internal calculation. We want to make this right. We want to give you a check for this amount of back pay. We're going to change your classification such that you're going to receive overtime. In many circumstances, that means that you have to necessarily reduce the employee salary to make sure that when they get the overtime, they're ultimately netting the same amount at the end of the year. So that might be a difficult conversation to have, but necessary. In any event, you could come out and you could say all of that with Mary. Sit down and say, we're just gonna, we're gonna own up to our mistake, okay? If you do that, I wanna be very clear here. There is no guarantee that Mary and or Mary's attorney will not turn around and file a claim under the Fair Labor Standards Act alleging that she was denied over time wrongfully. And this is why. It's because Fair Labor Standards Act claims, FLSA claims, can only be effectively settled with court approval or Department of Labor approval. So claims that require an employee to waive any and all actions under the FLSA, so, so releases that say those, that type of uh, thing generally, right, by signing this, I waive any and all claims under the FLSA, those type of releases have found to be invalid unless there's an ongoing FLSA action in court that the court is supervising settlement of, or there's been a Department of Labor investigation and the Department of Labor has reached a back pay amount and now that matter is being settled. Okay, so it doesn't mean that somebody is going to sue you because more often than not, when an employee signs a release like that and they get all the back pay that they were owed and they feel like they've been made whole, they're not then going to get an attorney and try to go after more. But just to be clear, if somebody did, they would argue that the release was invalid and that they're entitled to additional damages, such as liquidated damages, which can be the case in an FLSA action. So you would take whatever the back pay amount was and, and that can be accounted for in liquidated damages or attorney fees, things along those nature. So just to be clear, this is certainly an option. In many cases, it might be your best option, which is just to bite the bullet, address, address the mistake and move on. But it's not a guarantee that you're free from any future action, either initiated by the Department of Labor or an individual claiming that the claim is somehow still alive. So that's our misclassification mistake. There's also an IRS voluntary classification settlement program. Now, that is a program that allows employers to change the classification for independent contractors to employees, okay? So, this is a tricky little program. It sounds great, right? If I volunteer for this program, then I can make all these changes. My fines are reduced to 10% per employee for the tax liability that I would have paid to the IRS. So, I'm reducing my IRS. Uh, obligations. I'm fixing at least some of the tax consequences of not having paid employment taxes for an overtime wage that this employee earned um, or should have earned if I had classified them as an employee and instead I classified them as an independent contractor. With that said, I don't see many people and I, I have not seen any of my clients personally use the voluntary classification settlement to fix an independent contractor mistake because many times you're, you're creating a bigger mistake by going that route. 
there are a lot of resources regarding the Voluntary Classification Settlement Program on our website, and I know that Claudia Orr in particular has, has drafted an article regarding the Voluntary Classification Settlement Program and some of the pitfalls of that program. It is an option in certain circumstances, but it's not a, it's not a way to, to free and clearly fix any misclassification mistakes. So I just want to be upfront again with everyone on the call about that program. It's an option and it might be an option for you, but the, the title is slightly misleading. So where are we at today? And as far as misclassification mistakes, what is the biggest problem that I see on the horizon for my clients? The biggest issue I see on the horizon for my clients is something that we just became privy to on April 22nd, which is on April 22nd, the Michigan Attorney General, who is now Dana Nessel, announced that she has established a, quote, payroll fraud enforcement unit, end quote, within the AG's department. So she has established this, and the reason why, as articulated in the press release, is to, quote, crack down on companies that cheat workers rot and rob millions from taxpayers. So we are going to, and we already have, seen an increase in activity from the Michigan Unemployment Insurance Agency, or the UIA, that will be conducting audits to figure out if people, companies, have inappropriately classified individuals as independent contractors instead of employees. And if they did that, then they wouldn't have been paying unemployment tax, okay? So this is a long-winded way of saying, if you're in one of the industries that's in this bottom bullet point, you need to be prepared for an audit launched by the Michigan State Unemployment Insurance Agency that will focus on any individual that you have classified as an independent contractor. Like I said, I've already seen a number, a number more audits this year than I have in, in several years. And this seems like something that they've rolled out with a lot of force and a lot of intent. So they are going to be cracking down on misclassification mistakes. So if you have a misclassification mistake, and maybe it's not Mary, maybe in our scenario it's Michael, and you find out that Michael has been classified as an independent contractor, but he's had a relationship with your company for five years, and it looks a lot like Michael is an employee, and you're in one of these industries in particular, you have unemployment claims, you have an ongoing relationship with the unemployment insurance agency, I would be very concerned about somebody knocking on your door and or sending you a letter asking for all of Michael's records and doing a broad investigation so that they can try to recoup some of the unemployment insurance tax that they feel you should have been paying and also try to ascertain whether there are any damages that they can seek for Michael. So just something for everybody to keep in mind. Again, just summarizing where we're at with misclassification mistakes. This is probably the trickiest one that I've seen um, because it, it happens so frequently and so slowly over time. So we need to beware of slow and subtle changes to jobs that take them from exempt to non-exempt overnight. Beware of the IRS voluntary classification program. Be, be aware that it exists, one, and aware that it's not a catch-all uh, program. And then also be aware of the focus on the Michigan Attorney General. Keep in mind, if you're, you're sitting in your office right now and you know you have a number of misclassification mistakes, that the Department of Labor's proposed rule with regard to new changes to the salary threshold was issued on March 7th of 2019. So we should get some final guidance with regard to that here in the summer, probably within the next couple of months. And that might be a great time when, say, if the new salary threshold is set at what's been suggested, $35,000 right around there, might be a great time to, again, shift some people around fix some of those mistakes without raising a bunch of red flags. What about the overpayment scenario, okay? So you have James, Mark, and Lisa. They're operators. They're paid $14.50 an hour or about $580 a week. Due to a payroll error, they all get a $1.75 increase, and multiple checks are $70 more than they should have been, okay? So there's a lot of numbers here, a lot of math involved. Let's get to the crux of the matter. So you find out these people are overpaid you know, you're looking at $1,000. It's not, not going to shatter the company, but it's certainly money that you want to recoup, and you also don't want to create an expectation that their salary has just been increased permanently. So, moving on to the next slide. Do you need consent? Okay, what do you do to deduct it? Do you have to go to all these people and say, listen, we screwed up, we messed up your payment, 
we need consent, okay? The, the applicable law for this is not the federal law, it's the Michigan statute, the Michigan Payment of Wages and Fringe Benefits Act. It allows for a deduction for a wage or fringe benefit overpayment without written consent if, if, and that's a big if, underline it, bold it, if you can meet certain requirements, okay? So the requirements are outlined on our next slide. First, you cannot do it if the employee's rate of pay is not greater than the minimum wage per hour, okay? So if you have somebody that's making the minimum wage, you don't in this scenario, but assuming you did, you can never do it without consent because any deduction is gonna drop them below minimum wage. If the overpayment is the result of a mathematical error, clerical error, typo, something like that, exactly what we have here, then you get to continue to the next slide. If not, then you're, you're stuck. You cannot do any deduction without consent. But if you have a person making more than minimum wage and it's a payroll clerical error, then what do you do? You can make a deduction if you catch it within six months, okay? It's gotta be within six months. If the employee receives a written notice of the deduction at least one pay period before it is made, if the deduction amount is less than 15% of the employee's gross wage earnings, okay? So in our scenario, you could not deduct all of it at once, it would be too much. Uh, if all other required or authorized deductions are made first, and if the hourly rate of the employee does not drop below minimum wage. So there's a bit of math involved unless you have a high wage earner. And generally what we'll see is deductions made over the span of time. So these four deductions might be recouped in eight paychecks. Um, you know, you might provide a, a notification saying, FYI, there was this error to recoup it over the course of your next eight paychecks. We're gonna deduct your wages as follows. And then you spell it out in writing. They've been provided the notice. They understand what to expect when moving forward. It's a big mistake if you try to make a huge deduction all at once. Uh, it's also a mistake if you try to deduct from the last paycheck, okay? So I know a lot of people that, that will catch errors either with payroll or with equipment or with property and they like to deduct from the last paycheck. Unless you have signed written consent relative to certain deductions, then you're stuck, okay? So this provides for no written consent in cases of overpayments that have specific uh, eligibility factors that must be met. Okay, generally taking from an employee's last paycheck for whatever the case might be is a bad practice and a bad idea unless you've talked to somebody and you know that what you're doing is entirely compliant. The law as a general matter wants everybody to get paid what they're told they're going to be paid and only have deductions come out if they know about it and if they've been given advance notice to make an objection or to clarify any questions that they might have. So that premise is what you need to use when trying to determine, okay, is this something that we need to look at closer and do some research or is this something that we can do with no problem? So moving on, this is a big one, okay? So this is, this is the one that I, I've seen, uh, like I said earlier, an increase in activity and if you haven't, if you haven't had an audit yet um, and you get audited, don't feel like you're alone because this is happening. So our scenario, knock, knock, give me all your records. It's Friday, 3 o'clock p.m., it's May. You're dreaming about nothing other than your weekend, getting out, it's supposed to be a little bit warmer, knock on wood. All of a sudden, somebody arrives, introduces himself as Thomas Dollard, investigator, U.S. Department of Labor, Wage and Hour Division, okay? Thomas comes in, he's buttoned up, suit and tie, hands you a request for records, okay, a letter. He says, I'm here for this, just hand it to you. And the letter looks something like this. Okay, so this is taken from an actual letter and this is pretty much their form template. So I'm not gonna read all of this, but this is a perfect example. They come in and they give you a letter, sometimes the date. So in our example, the letter date is August 1st. Sometime that date in the letter is the exact date that they've shown up at your door, okay? But they come in and they say, we wanna do an investigation and we want all these records for the last two years. And these are again, specific examples of records. Almost all audits include requests for these records. 
So you're going to get the and, – and they're, they're templates. So I've had a lot of companies that don't have a board, that don't have corporate officers, and they look at me and like, don't they know who we are? They don't, right? These are template requests. So they're going to ask for all the, the background information regarding the company. They're going to ask for your gross annual dollar, dollar volume of sales. You are going to say why. The reason why is because they want to make sure that, that you meet the jurisdictional criteria for them to investigate. Because under $500,000, then it's a state investigation. But I've never seen a company not meet it because it's, it's volume of sales or revenue. It has nothing to do with profit. So, you know, and even then there's still arguments that they make as it relates to certain industries that they have the right to investigate. They also want to confirm that you have engaged in interstate commerce. Why? Because if you've solely done interstate commerce, then they don't have jurisdiction to investigate. So if they don't have jurisdiction, it stops there. Jurisdiction is an extremely difficult thing for us to say does not exist, okay? When I think about entities that, that might not fall within the FLSA, and therefore the DOL can't investigate, I think of maybe lifeguards, um, very small entities. If you're using a credit card to purchase materials from out of state, you're covered. If you're using phones and calling people out of state, you're covered. If you have a fax machine that's in, taking faxes from out of state, you're covered. So intrastate commerce is, is sort of a misleading and simplistic phrase. So they're gonna ask you all these background things just to confirm that you're covered. Then they're gonna ask you for a list of all employees. Some investigations, some, a small subset, might have the request tailored to a specific department. That usually gives us an indication that there's been a complaint or that they've, they have prior information that leads them to believe that there's a departmental issue. Generally, um, what will happen is you'll get a, a request for all employees, okay? So they'll ask you for, for the breakdown of what do they do, what's their name, are they exempt, are they non-exempt? After asking you for all that background information, they'll include requests for payroll and time records for the most recently completed payroll and sample payroll and time records for the last two quarters. They'll ask you for 1099 forms and contract documents with any independent contractors, subcontractors, or day laborers, and any other payments made to employees. So these are sort of the simplistic records that they'll ask you for with the initial demand. So you get this, it's Friday at three o'clock, what are you gonna do? The first thing you're gonna do is ask them to return, okay? You're never, ever, as long as I'm advising you, going to open your door the first day a Department of Labor investigator knocks and let them in and then say, we'll start getting these records for you. Okay, generally, the Department of Labor has got to provide employers 72 hours to respond, which doesn't seem like a lot of time. That's the minimum. More often than not, they're very flexible and they'll give us a week or two weeks. They're not going to give you months and they're not going to, they're not just going to say, okay, we, we'll, we'll, we'll stop and we won't bother you anymore. They're going to come in. It's just a matter of when and who is there. So the first thing you do is you say, thank you so much, as politely as you can. You know, I need to uh, elevate this. I need to take this up the chain. I need to talk to, about this with my partner. Um, can we contact you and schedule this for next week? Can we contact you and schedule this for, you know, early the week after next because next week we're going on vacation? Whatever the case might be, okay? The investigator will say, okay, I understand, and leave, all right? Then what you do is you should contact the appropriate personnel, owner, president, CFO, whoever that might be internally, and then legal counsel, if applicable, and get everybody involved. What will generally happen if I get involved or if counsel gets involved or if you have somebody else get involved is a communication will be sent to the investigator. I like all of those things to be done in writing so that we have a clear, a clear chain of communications explaining, you know, we received this request for an investigation. You know, we, we intend to fully comply. We, we're not available until Friday, uh, May, May 17th. Can we adjourn this until then? Also, is it possible for us to deliver the records that you've requested via a share file link or a Dropbox? as opposed to an on-site inspection, because the majority of our records are maintained electronically, and we think for ease of review, that might be the easiest option, okay? If that's true, those are the type of proposals we can make. In certain cases, they'll say, that's fine, we don't need to come to your site, we'll just take the records. In other cases, they want on your site, okay? They want on your site for a number of reasons. They wanna see if you have the posters up. They wanna see if employees are around. They wanna see what it looks like. They wanna get a feel for the environment. 
all of those things, okay? So sometimes they'll tell me, that's fine, a share file link will work. Other times they'll say, nope, we're gonna do this on site, okay? And then what you should do is you should make sure that you've verified the credentials of the investigator. So in our, our scenario, we wanna make sure that Thomas is who Thomas says he is, which we can do that very easily. And we also wanna figure out who exactly is going to be present during the investigation. Is that counsel? Is it the president? Is it the HR director? Is it the CFO? A rule of thumb is that you never want too many people present, okay? So they will oftentimes ask for additional interviews, additional information, that's fine. We gotta make them work for it a little bit, okay? In, in the most respectful way possible. We're not just gonna open up our executive leadership team for an interview when not, not requested. So if you have an initial conference on the books and you're preparing for it, we should make sure that those that, that can actually answer questions relating to how employees are paid are there. The worst case scenario is that you have too many people there and they provide conflicting information, or you have somebody present that does not actually know what is going on. I'm willing to bet if I surveyed my law firm right now, non-employment attorneys, people that don't deal with this world, and I ask them, hey, if I pay somebody a salary every week, I don't have to give them overtime, right? I'm willing to bet 75% would say, yeah, that's right. If you pay them a salary, you don't have to give them overtime. So it doesn't matter what they're doing, just that they're getting a salary. And I'm willing to bet you have that at your office as well. So the last thing you want is somebody like that sitting in a meeting with a, a DOL investigator who says, well, I don't get what the deal is here because these people have got their salary, right? Those type of offhand comments can be extremely problematic. So we wanna figure out who's gonna be at that initial conference and what do we have to do to prepare. So after we go through that, um, what, do we, what do we talk about next? How many times do I get this question? Almost every time. Can I tell the investigator we're not gonna participate? There's nothing here, this is, this is a waste of everybody's time. No, okay, I mean, you can. I'm not telling you what you can and cannot say. That is not advised, okay? Consenting to the investigation will almost always result in a more advantageous result to the company than insisting that they go and get a subpoena because they will get a subpoena. If they're going through the process of picking up your business, showing up, having the request, they're not gonna just say, well, we don't wanna jump through the last hoop of getting a subpoena. All they have to do is, is send it in. It's not a difficulty for them at all. But if you push back and you make them get a subpoena, now, they're, now they think, well, clearly this company has something to hide. And these people are difficult and they're not gonna work with us and it's gonna be a problem. I had a DOL investigation and the investigator told me that you know, it, they've never, he, and I, you've all heard this before, I'm sure, when talking to attorneys, but he's never lost a case that's been tried, and every time they've ever tried a case, the ultimate verdict or judgment against the employer is significantly worse than it would have been if they would have just participated in the investigation, accepted the findings, and moved on, okay? So, just something to keep in mind. Also, if you start pushing back too early in the process, then requests later on to limit the scope of investigatory materials are likely to be denied. So if they think that you're stonewalling them from the outset, they're not gonna give you any, any give as the investigation continues. So after you've confirmed that you're not gonna tell the investigator to kick rocks, we need to figure out what, we, what we're gonna do for the opening conference. So almost always what, ta what happens is they show up with a letter, they send you a letter, a conference is scheduled within two to, two to three weeks, and then we need to figure out where and what are we gonna produce. So this is what I like to do. Uh, their requests will be numbered, generally one through 12, one through 13, something like that. So I like to print out a cover sheet for each request that says request, what it is, answer, you know, please see exhibit one. Some requests you're not gonna have information. So some requests you might say, you know, the company does not have information responsive to this, to this request, okay? And then you have it all tabbed and in a binder or in piles or in a way that it, they can very clearly see, okay, where's one? Here's, here's exhibit one. Where's two? Here's exhibit two. And copies for them, so a copy for them all ready to go, the original's preserved, a copy for you, so you know that you have an identical version of what you sent to the Department of Labor or what you gave them to take away. And so there's no question regarding, oh shoot, what was exhibit two again, okay? So it should all be there ready to go. If you, you, know, if you have the capability, bait stamping documents is always helpful because then we can reference specific bait stamps. Also labeling all documentation that might be confidential as confidential and proprietary. Stamping it is something that is highly recommended. You get your, your nice, clean binder of documents, 
put it in a separate conference room, okay? The last thing you want is somebody coming in and out of your office or your president's office or the CFO's office or an area where employees are. If we can put the person someplace where it's well lit, it's comfortable, there's access to internet and power because they typically bring print, um, printers and they, they work off of laptops more often than not. So if we can have all that there and then binders, it is far more likely that they're going to come in and say, I got what I need, I'm going to get out. Versus if they come in and you're still pulling time cards and you're trying to find this and you say, I think it might be on my computer, you're sitting on your laptop saying, I think it might be in this file. Now they're going to say, well, what else is there? Or they might see that you have additional records where if we have everything printed off and in binders ready to go in advance, they don't get to peek behind the curtain and just start poking around and figuring out what else might be there. So I'm, I'm pretty uh, steadfast in doing what we can to minimize interruptions and requests for additional information while they're on site, also minimizing, minimizing employee interruption and involvement. So that's the preparation for the opening conference as far as what we do before they get there. Once they get there, they generally go through a script and there are resources online that the department publishes that talks about their investigators. Uh, it's an investigator's field guide, I believe, where they'll talk about what, what they generally do. So they come on, on prop, property, they investigate, they tell you that this is what we're here for, that we have the right to do this, that we might question employees. They describe the purpose and investigation procedure, okay? So we're here today to investigate overtime violations or other, you know, it might be child labor violations, those type of issues under the Fair Labor Standards Act, okay? So they'll tell you that. I have a lot of clients that say, why us? Did somebody file a complaint? Who filed a complaint? Okay. They're not going to tell you the whys. They're not going to tell you who filed the complaint when prompted. I had one investigator mention that he had a, a geographic area and he was basically going down the street to different businesses of a, a similar nature, uh, grocery stores. And so one grocery store got hit after another just because of the location, but that was rare for that investigator to volunteer it. I've never seen an investigator, especially when asked, did somebody file a complaint, say yes or no, or even indicate who filed the complaint. And that's often always what the company wants to know, and they're just not going to tell you that. So they're just going to tell you some vanilla stuff about what they're there to do and how they're there, how they're going to do it in their authority. After they get through that, they're going to gather and review all the data. They might want to tour your facility. They might not. The more organized we can be, the less likely they're going to want to tour. They might want to interview your employees. They might not. Okay? If they're employees that are subordinate, non-management level employees, I, as your attorney, cannot be present. Okay? Attorneys, corporate representatives cannot be present for non-managerial employee witnesses. Okay? The, that doesn't mean that I can't talk to them in advance. So if the Department of Labor says, listen, we'd like to interview these employees, I can say, all right, I'm going to just touch base with them quickly. Or if they give us an advance notice, then we can always have an in-person preparation conference. But it's very important that employees do not indicate that they've been coached or counseled to say or not say certain things, okay? So if you're in a situation where you're handling an audit and you have an employee that's going to get interviewed, I would say you need to tread very carefully if you're going to do the preparation for that employee interview. Generally, you want to farm it out to an attorney, but if you're doing it, there are a couple of rules that need to be repeatedly explained to the employee. They're not in trouble. They're not going to be retaliated against. They need to tell the truth. They don't have to guess, okay? They don't have to guess, but they need to tell the truth. If you tell your employees those things, you're not in trouble. You're not going to be retaliated against. You don't have to guess, but you do have to tell the truth. They're likely to regurgitate that in some fashion, and then the investigator will say, okay, this employer is not trying to sand these employees. If you go into the, the employee interview preparation and you say, we did nothing wrong, right? Like, you've never seen this happen. You, you would agree that you've always been paid all your wages and start sort of cross-examining your employees. Then they're going to go and they're going to say in that interview, you know, I was told that the company did nothing wrong and, and that I was never paid inappropriately. They're going to regurgitate that in some fashion, probably in a fashion that's not great for us. Okay, so employee preparation is very important. And, employee, and the Department of Labor views the, the employee interview as the most important part of their investigatory process. They put a lot of weight in what the employees say and, and how they say it. So after all of that, what generally happens is the Department of Labor leaves, 
and then they, they usually send one or two, sometimes three, sometimes four, requests for additional information. Listen, we saw this discrepancy. Do you have any additional records regarding that? Listen, I see that this employee worked some overtime. Do you have any records regarding payments that were issued that you haven't already provided me? I have had some clients that have paid employees cash, multiple clients, for you know extra work, and the Department of Labor will take that into consideration. So don't hesitate to say, listen, we have this check register, we have these, these payments that were made, they will take that into consideration when trying to calculate if there's a back pay award, what that back pay award is. After they go through this process, which sometimes takes weeks and sometimes takes months, they'll contact your counsel or you and say, we'd like to schedule a, a post audit conference. And at the closing audit, they'll come in and they'll walk you through what they found what your rights are, okay? Again, they're not gonna tell you who complained or who informed them as it relates to violations, okay? It's very important in a closing conference not to agree or admit to any wrongdoing, not to promise and not to argue. At a closing conference, you are there to basically intake information, figure out exactly what they're telling you, and then if there's a factual or legal error, correct it, okay? So if there's something that they just got dead wrong, then we need to say, listen, we think that this is a mistake. Can we have an opportunity to respond and correct it? They, more often than not, want to work with you, and they want to get it right, too, because the last thing they want is an objection going to the Secretary of Labor, their boss, saying, FYI, your investigators screwed these things up, and that being the case. Okay, so these investigators, they want to make sure the record is correct. Um, but if the record is correct and there's nothing we can say about it, then all we need to say is, okay, we'll review, and we'll get back to you accordingly. So that's typically the closing conference. So moving on to Christina's realm in the uninvestigated allegation, I will kick it over to her. Christina, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, now you're good. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone from lovely Columbus, Ohio, and thank you, Courtney. Courtney scares me half the time. I know if I was in trouble, she'd be my first call. So before we, I'm going to talk just a few minutes about uh, something that we as human resources professionals have seen a million times, which is the um, human resources finds out last in the uninvestigated allegation realm. But first, let me just say a word about our overarching topic, which is mitigating mistakes. And I learned from a lawyer mentor of mine a very long time ago that in a lot of circumstances, it's not the initial mistake that ends up getting you in trouble. It's the cover-up, or it's what we refer to as the cover-up. And you'll notice in many of the political investigations that go on and that are reported in the news that a lot of times the charges are lying to the police or obstruction of justice when uh, the whole issue could have been handled if a mistake was admitted and dealt with as opposed to trying to cover it up. So I think that's probably one of our overarching messages to all of you today. If you do discover a mistake, people make mistakes, don't try to hide it, pick up the phone, give us a call, and we will work our way through it together. So the uninvestigated allegation is our next topic. So the scenario is that you find out during an EEOC investigation that Sherry complained about Jonathan's sexual harassment to her boss, Jerry, weeks ago. The complaint was not elevated and Sherry ended up being terminated. So Sherry is not alleging retaliation. Uh, and Jerry, uh, as a manager, was defined as the correct person to whom the complaints of harassment should be directed. So, what do you do? Is it too late to launch an investigation? And I will tell you, these are the types of questions that we get a lot because there are a lot of times, again, human resources is the last to know, and sometimes employees have been terminated. 
Um, supervisors have been terminated before human resources even finds out that there was an issue. And I'll talk in a minute uh, about in what circumstances you maybe wouldn't do an investigation uh, and in what circumstances you would. But in the case scenario that we gave here, is it too late? No, immediately launch an investigation. One of the reasons you want to launch an investigation is because the person against whom the harassment complaints were made is still employed at your company. So I suppose there could be, and there have been situations where we've um, had cases where, for instance, a supervisor or a co-employee, we learned that there were allegations of harassment or other behavior against that person after that person has been terminated. So the question is, if the wrongdoer is already gone, do you still need to do an investigation? That's the only time that potentially, based upon the, whatever the specific circumstances are, that we may recommend that you don't have to do an investigation. But in this circumstance that we're talking about in our example today occurs, then you do in fact need to do an investigation because you have to get to the bottom of two things. Has there been an inappropriate behavior by an employee who still remains employed by you? And was Sherry's termination wrongful in any fashion. So launch an investigation. You, you probably need to talk to Sherry, so you'll need to ascertain whether she's represented by a lawyer, whether she's willing to talk to you about the prior allegations that she made, and then you need to go forward with reviewing the reasoning for her termination to begin with, the performance-based reasoning. Again, you know, doing investigations is not a matter of admitting uh, liability. You don't have to admit to any of the, you know, underlying uh, sexual harassment allegations. You may find out that there is something that needs to be addressed. You may find out that there's nothing to it. But ignoring it in a situation like this is something that you absolutely should not do. So once you uh, conduct your investigation and figure out whether there is any action that actually needs to be taken, um, you know, you need to put prompt remedial action in place because remember, an employer's responsibility is several fold. First of all, it needs to have policies in place to prevent the occurrence of sexual harassment or other types of discrimination in the workplace. It needs to have a reporting structure in place so that employees can report these types of claims within the workplace. And then it needs to take prompt remedial action should there be any evidence that there has been illegal conduct in the workplace. So that responsibility to take prompt remedial action remains in this case even after Sherry's employment has, has been terminated because again, the alleged wrongdoer is still employed by the company. Now, what do you do with Sherry then? So let's uh, find the scenario that <clears throat> Maybe you do, after your investigation, realize that Sherry was wrongfully terminated and was terminated because of her, even though she has not alleged retaliation, but was terminated in retaliation for her complaints about her coworker. So what do you do in that case? You know, you, you may have to approach Sherry and potentially offer her her job back. I mean, that could cut down on any future liability with respect to a lawsuit that she, she could file following your investigation. So there are a lot of different things that, that you might want to consider in the course um, of, of this. Now, the next question on our next screen is, how far do we go down the rabbit hole? So let's say you find that potentially Sherry did have some valid complaints about her coworker. Do you go back and talk to more people? Do you, do you dig back into the um, um, annals of time to figure out if there are any other potential employees that could potentially have claims against the company based upon the conduct of this employee? You know, these are all case-by-case -case basis analyses um, that, could, that you really should evaluate, but one of the things we always want to figure out in the course of an investigation is, you know, we don't know what we don't know. So if you're not doing investigation, then you don't even know what's out there and you have no way to prepare for it. 
So, you know, it may, there may be situations where you decide that you have to go back and talk to formerly, formerly terminated employees. It's just going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. But the worst thing you can do is ignore it and, and try to figure out a way to not have any of this come to light. It's better that you know what's out there so that you can prepare for it than to be blindsided by something, something coming down the pike in the future. So we're on, let's see, I think we can go to the next slide. So um, some things to keep in mind um, when you're, you're looking at this and, and deciding how far to go down the rabbit hole, you know, focus on your current employees, focus on you, who you still have there. You may want to go back and interview folks that have been terminated, but focus on the current employees for the time. Um, you know, the applicable statute of limitations, you, you may have less heartburn talking to former employees if those employees' claims are barred by a, an applicable statute of limitations. That's always a possibility. Again, assess the worst case scenario. Um, uh, exposure, you have to figure out what it is you don't know and what could potentially be out there around the corner that could bite you. And, you know, don't, don't, don't fear creating a slippery slope and potentially, it, and listen, we, we talk about this all the time in the human resources business. And, and Courtney talked about it during her um, presentation as well. You know, should we not talk to employees because maybe we're now going to give them the idea that they have a claim when they didn't have one, when they, it never even occurred to them that they might have a claim. Well, you know, sometimes that's the risk that you have to take. I mean, your responsibility as an employer is to do a thorough and prompt investigation and take reasonable steps to make sure that um, any sort of inter-office issues are being immediately addressed and remedied. So, you know, there may be situations where you talk to people and I guess it's possible they could come up with the idea that they might have a claim, but that shouldn't stop you from going forward with doing a complete and thorough uh, investigation and working on changing your culture if that, if that is something that needs to be changed within your organization. All right. Here we go with our next scenario. Paul is a difficult personality in the workplace, and he is on his manager, Samantha's radar. Uh, she has reported several issues to human resources regarding Paul. Um, she reports that he has ongoing in uh, attendance issues, which are verified by a review of his time card. Um, human Resources places him, Paul, on a performance improvement plan. Uh, when he's put on the PIP, he becomes extremely agitated and is accusing his supervisor, Samantha, of favoritism. Specifically, according to Paul, Samantha has bowling buddies who are allowed to leave work early on the bowling days and are um, habitually late on the next morning after the bowling night. So what do you do in this situation? So you have an employee, and remember, we see this all the time, when employees are disciplined, they all of a sudden have all kinds of complaints that they've never thought of before and are bringing you these complaints. So I always advise people to, you know, take complaints that are coming from an employee who has just been disciplined with a grain of salt. At the same time, you have to be sure that you're not ignoring legitimate complaints. So, you know, and this is great advice that is on this slide. You don't want to walk out of the meeting with Paul and go confront Samantha. So what you want to do is you want to start doing your homework first. Do your background um, um, review before you talk to Samantha about it. You know, look at the time cards of the employees to which he is referring. See if that is actually true. See if there's a pattern. You know, potentially, if you see that there may be something going on, talk to other neutral employees, you know, employees that haven't just been disciplined by Samantha to get their take on what's been going on. And look for other ways to substantiate the allegations. A lot of companies now have surveillance video, so you can see when people are going in and out of the parking garage, so you can confirm whether people are leaving early or coming in late the next morning. And then, you know, depending on what you find out, and like I said, a lot of times, look, it happens a lot of times, employees are disciplined and they bring up complaints, and a lot of times they're not valid. But if they are, I mean, 
you have to do something to remedy it. You are the human resources professional. There's been something that's brought to your attention that's inappropriate in the workplace, and you need to, you know, take care of it. You need to, to review and potentially, um, well, at least bring it to the attention of um, Samantha as well as the employees to whom she's been giving special treatment. You're going to have to make sure that the attendance policies are being um, applied to everyone equally, set expectations moving forward, and, you know, if Samantha needs to be disciplined, discipline Samantha, um, and decide what it is that you want to do with the employees who are being given the benefit of these bowling nights. Now, in a case like this, you know, you have to think very hard about disciplining employees who had the at least tacit approval of their employer of their direct supervisor for what they were doing so these might not be employees that you want to crack down on hard but you do need to tell them that this is not going to happen anymore and set clear expectations going forward in the future So again, you know, the considerations um, that we are talking about today with respect to mitigating mistakes, you need to balance your business priorities with the one million and new coming out every day, regulations and laws that apply in the workplace. Mistakes happen, acknowledge them, accept them, and move forward. Again, the worst thing you can do is engage in some sort of cover-up or try to hide the problem because it always ends up coming out and the cover-up always ends up being worse than the original mistake. And the company initiatives and changes that you may put into place when you've made a mistake, you know, there's a real validity to the phrase that we all learn from our mistakes. So if you are identifying mistakes, dealing with them up front, then you can potentially put in effect changes that will benefit your company going forward and will lead to things working more smoothly, fixing long-standing problems and avoiding the practices in the past that have put the company at risk. Okay, thank you, Christina. Uh, the time has come now for Q&A. Um, we do have our questions window available to your GoToWebinar go to window, so please take a moment. If you have a question, pop that in real quickly. We do have a couple that I will um, start with, and the first one is, uh, can we contest a finding issued by the Department of Labor after a wage in our audit? Okay, I'll jump in to address that. So, yes, you can, okay? So, so you're not forced to take whatever the audit revealed and, and your hands are not tied as far as making an objection. With that said, you need to figure out is there a factual issue here or is there a legal issue? Because if the point of objecting is just objecting and asking for a smaller reward, that's not going to get you anywhere. If, if you know that the facts that they've found are accurate and we look at it and say those facts as applied to this law warrants a conclusion that, that you um, you know, had, a, had an issue with this provision of the FLSA, then going back and trying to negotiate is going to be futile, okay? The Department of Labor, at least over the past couple of years, has not been openly negotiating back pay awards when they've determined that there is a violation and they, there's um, substantial evidence to support it. Their position is, quite frankly, if you want to screw around with this, we'll take it to the Secretary of Labor, file a lawsuit, and we'll win. So you have a very limited amount of negotiating power, but please don't feel like you've got none. And certainly, if there is a factual issue, if there's an exaggerated representation, if there's a document that was not considered, a payment that was not considered, that should definitely be brought to the Department of Labor's attention. Great. Thanks, Courtney. Um, a couple of people are asking about whether the slides will be available. Yes, they will. I'll, I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, our next question, um, and again, please take a minute and pop in your question to the questions window. The next question is, are there ever any times that an employer would not proceed with a quote-unquote late investigation? I'll jump in on that. I, uh, this is Christina. I touched on that a little bit during my uh, presentation, and the answer is yes. I mean, sometimes there are 
situations where you won't take uh, what, where you won't take on a late investigation. Let me give you one that came uh, to light recently. Um, I had an employer who had a supervisor die in a car accident, and he passed away. And about three or four months after he passed away, a woman came forward and made some claims of sexual harassment against him. We we documented what her complaints were. We make sure we made sure we had them in our file. But frankly, there wasn't a whole lot to do because the supervisor who had been um, accused of misconduct was not only no longer at the company but was dead. So that would be an example of a time that we would not do go forward with a late investigation. But those are actually rare situations. So if you have a situation where, even if you have a situation where, let's say an employee who's been, who has been accused of misconduct, depending on how serious that misconduct is, even if they are no longer with your company, you may want to do an investigation because they're working somewhere. And, and you know, many of my employers and companies that I represent um, have a sense of responsibility to the community in general that if there is someone that may be a danger to others, that they will do an investigation and, and document it and make sure all of that is documented. There may be some situations where if it's minor, for instance, personality conflicts and the person alleged to have caused problems is gone from the company, you may not do an investigation or a full investigation. Um, but, you know, generally if the folks about who the complaint is being made are still there, even if the complaint is late, most times you would want to go forward with the investigation and there would be, you know, a narrow circumstances where you would not. Great, thanks, Christina. Um, just a couple more questions here. Um, this one is, if you give an employee in advance and they haven't paid it back before they, they uh, terminate, can you collect the loan balance from their final check even if, taker, if, if it takes the whole check? In, in advance that you voluntarily gave, I would not. Um, if you're giving an employee in advance, prior to them starting their employment, you should make it conditioned of specifically on them completing, for example, six months or a year or two years. And then there should be language in the offer letter or in the letter pertaining to the advance spelling out what happens in the event that the employee does not stay the entire time. And if the employee does not stay and does not repay the advance, what I would do is file a claim, either small uh, claims court claim or district court action or something along those lines, uh, because that that you're not recouping an uh, improper deduction, you're not recouping, you know, the cost of tools or something like that. In that case, it's an agreement that you made to pay them in advance at the time of employment that they've then breached. So it's a separate contract. And I think if you tried to recoup that via deduction, you're going to run into issues under the Michigan uh, Payment of Wages and Fringe Benefits Act. And last Great, one, one caveat to yeah. that. Let me Let me yeah. say this. You can always have the employee sign off consent to the deduction at that time. So, for example, at the, with the advance agreement, I know most of my clients do advance agreements where they say, if you're not with the company for a year, then we'll recoup that advance. If you say, we'll recoup that advance via deduction from your last paycheck, whatever is whatever the, the ratio is that is entitled to be paid back to the company, and the person signs off on it and, and understands the amount, then you're fine. But without consent, just doing it, um, without the employee's consent and as a way to recoup those funds, you're going to have issues. Great, thanks. Okay, the last question I have here, I think it's more of a point of clarification maybe for Courtney. Um, some of the comments early on about investigations had to do with uh, the state, and this person is asking about whether they correctly heard that there was a new uh, regime in Michigan that may be a little more unfriendly to uh, employers and that person's just trying to understand if, if that's a perspective we have. Yes, so, so I don't want to uh, throw any government entities or agencies under the bus. What I want to do is to bring to light an announcement that was made. So on April 22nd, the Michigan Attorney General, who is new given the last election cycle, announced that she has created a specific task force that's doing nothing but focusing on payroll pay fraud issues, primarily related to the misclassification of employees. And that's under Michigan law. And what they're looking at is from really an unemployment perspective. So if you get an unemployment audit, it's presumably because of that task force. 
So what they're saying is by not by misclassifying people, you're not paying one the unemployment insurance that you should have been to the government, and those those employees are getting the brunt of a bad decision or an intentionally fraudulent decision. So the attorney general has created a task force that's going to be ramping up investigatory and enforcement efforts in particular industries, which will, and I've already seen it, have an impact on employers. So just be on the lookout. If you haven't been audited yet and you get a request for an audit, that's probably why. Perfect. Thanks for clarifying that. I'm going to move on. Uh, we have reached our time, uh, and so I want to wrap up just by uh, making a couple quick uh, uh, points here. Uh, after the conclusion of the webinar, you're, you're going to receive our survey. Uh, for those of you that join us regularly, you know that we look closely at that feedback and we try to incorporate any ideas you have for topics in the future. So please take a moment to complete that. Um, we also have our sophisticated employer webinar series continuing on June 4th. Um, this time we're going to be taking a look at the new um, uh, uh, pregnancy, pregnancy Leave Act in Michigan and how it is interplaying with the um, FMLA. And that'll be an interesting discussion on June 4th. So we hope you can Join us for that. Be on the lookout for our evites um, in your inbox. Another thing, I uh, personal, a little bit more personal to me, we've been working a long time on it, and we hope you will take a moment to take a look at our website. We've got a whole new look, a lot more content, new features, um, a lot of substantive legal content to help you do what you do day in and day out, including our uh, sophisticated employer blog and uh, all the content from these previous programs. Um, this, I promised I would mention this, the presentation file for today and the slide deck will be available on our event page soon. Uh, we try to get those done within uh, 48 hours, so just bear with us. Um, oftentimes we get to them faster than that and we'll do our best to deliver that to you and certainly share that link with any colleagues who couldn't be with you today or join us today. Um, also, last uh, kind of plug is our employment, uh, labor employment blog. It's called the Sophisticated Employer Blog. And you can sign up for alerts uh, by email. Simply type in your email, and anytime new content is added, you'll get an email to that effect. And you can stay abreast of the latest things that we're talking about and uh, our clients are dealing with. So um, we, we invite you to, to uh, follow that blog. Um, and at, at that point, I think we've kind of run through all of our materials for today. On behalf of Christina Coral and Courtney Nichols, I want to thank everybody for being with us, our employment uh, uh, law practice group. Certainly appreciate your attendance as well. Um, so with that, we'll wish, uh, wish you a, a great rest of the day and say so long.